Hey YouTube, what's up? My name is Tara and uh, welcome to my channel. What I'm going to talk about today is a topic that I've considered posting about for a couple of years now. I've seen other YouTubers post similar stories and so I figured maybe mine could help someone too. I grew up in what I would consider to be a pretty normal family. Um, my parents were younger whenever I was born. My my dad was 26 because he had already, you know, been in the Air Force and was going to school on his GI Bill. My mom was 20 and um, she was going to school for her real estate license. So my dad was in a fraternity uh, whenever he was in college and I was like little, little, like a baby and a toddler. And so he would bring in income sometimes from like bartending or being a bouncer at parties and stuff like that, like around campus. So I was always surrounded by you know, college age guys and their girlfriends and people were drinking and uh, playing flip cup and uh, playing spades and playing horseshoes and, you know, different things like that. And so I remember just from a very young age, you know, social drinking was very normal. It was something that um, everybody did. So I get a little bit older and uh, my dad gets out of college whenever I'm two and a half and we moved to one town then we moved for a job for him and then we moved to another town. And sometime during that period, I was really, really young. Um, three, four, some, five, something like that. Like I, I was really young. Um, I remember like wanting beer. I remember like, like having my first sips of beer whenever I was really, really little. Um, I remember there was one time I was probably about three or four years old and I wanted to get a sip of beer, st like steal a sip of beer out of a, a can that was in my parents' bedroom and I got a big mouthful of ashes. And I know the town that we were in at that time, so I had to have been probably about four years old. So I drank at a very early age. I had my first like taste of alcohol. So whenever we, whenever we moved, to Columbus. I grew up primarily in Columbus, Ohio. So whenever we moved up to Columbus from the small town where we were living, I was about five or six years old. And uh, I remember around that time, like my sister was born whenever I was five. I had just turned five. And I remember going to get my dad beers from the fridge. He'd be like, hey, Tara, go get me a beer, you know. And so I would go and get him a beer out of the fridge and I would bring it to him in the living room. And then he would hand me his empty can and I would take that and go throw it away for him. Well, because I had already had this taste for alcohol, I started cracking the can of beer whenever I was taking him a new one. And then I would take a sip of whatever was left in the bottom of the can whenever I took his old one to the trash. And I'm sure it was like probably mostly backwash but whatever you know I was a kid like little kid um so I I wanted to continue drinking I was getting ready to start third grade and we moved back up to Columbus so around that time I started getting picked on and bullied a lot because I was really different I went from like a school where there was like one one african-american family in the whole town <laughs> to like being one of like five white kids in the whole third grade out of three different classes of of third grade kids um so it was just huge culture shock and they teased me and they called me names and um but that's also when i met my best friend sarah and She's actually still my best friend today. Um, one of one of my two very best friends. So things were just awkward, you know, and I was heading into like puberty and everything was weird anyway. 
and I just didn't feel right. I felt like I was stuck in my own head. I felt like I was stuck in my body and there was no way out. And I didn't know what to do about it. But I knew that whenever I saw people drink, it made them feel better. They would laugh and smile and have fun. And I just wanted that, you know, I just wanted to feel okay in my own skin. And so I would drink basically whenever I had the opportunity. And I was a troubled kid. I was always in trouble. I skipped school and I ran away multiple times. Um, I stopped caring about school. I didn't care about my grades. I was, I was bored in school was part of it because I'm the type of person that I will like research something until I know everything about it and then I'm bored with it. Um, and, and so like also, you know, just like that obsessive personality, <laughs> you know, that comes with being someone who's interested in drugs and alcohol and like takes everything to the extreme, right? So I just went wild. Um, I was in trouble a lot. Like I didn't get in trouble with the law, but honestly that's because like my parents didn't really let me out of their sight very much. Um, I was allowed to date and everything, but I wasn't ever allowed to go to parties. I wasn't, um, I wasn't allowed to like go and walk around the neighborhood with like the other neighborhood girls or whatever. Um, you know, I, I just, I would say that I was in, um, more of a strict household. My parents absolutely loved me, but like I grew up in the 80s and 90s. And so like back then people parented differently, you know. Um, and so I was just, I was on lockdown <laughs> is how I felt about it. I felt like I was on lockdown all the time. And not only could I not get out of my own head, but like I couldn't get out of the house. I had no freedom. I just felt completely claustrophobic. Like that's the best way that I can explain it is I just felt claustrophobic. Um, and so I graduated high school around that time. I was talking to like different people online, you know, uh, Yahoo messenger was huge. And I turned 18 the beginning of my senior year. And so I started talking to like guys online and like my senior year, like I went on several dates with different people, um, who were older than me, you know, just to kind of see what it was like other than, you know, the dumb high school boys that I went to school with. Um, so I met this guy and I had talked to him like at the end of my senior year and then I went out of town to go and stay with family for a couple of months. I come back, um, I've got my license and my first car and like my first taste of freedom and I freaked out like I was just tired of feeling trapped. And so I went on a date with this guy and long story short, like overnight basically moved in with him. And six months later, I'm pregnant. During that whole like six month time period or whatever, I started experimenting with all kinds of different drugs. I mean, everything from like, I started smoking pot. I think I had smoked pot maybe like three or four times my whole high school career. And that's part of it was like my parents thought that I was high all the time, but I wasn't because I was so paranoid about the fact that they would like find out that I was high and I would be in real trouble. Like if, if I'm in this much trouble from not even like doing anything and you think that I'm doing something, then imagine how big a trouble I would be in if I was actually like really doing something that I shouldn't have been doing, you know? So I start smoking pot all the time. Um, I wasn't working. Um, and this guy was like, oh, I'll take care of you and I'll help you to, co I'll help you go to college and, and just like all of this different stuff. But like, honestly, it was just party, party, party. So like I'm experimenting with like cocaine and uh, ecstasy and meth like we were I was like snorting meth and um, before I know it I'm pregnant
baby daddy and I uh, are just homeless while I'm pregnant. I mean, almost the whole pregnancy. Uh, about two or three months, maybe before I get pregnant or before I uh, give birth, um, we get this little house and we start, you know, painting the inside and like this crackhead lady had lived there and she would stand out on her front porch and like scream just like obscenities and stuff like she was like seeing stuff I don't know maybe she was on meth but um everybody in the neighborhood thought it was crack so we're living in this house and and uh my aunt was a nurse um she she was like the director of nursing at this hospital where I was gonna give birth to my daughter and she comes to me and she tells me, like, I know what you've been doing. I know that the house that you and this guy are going to bring this kid into um, is not going to be a drug-free, like, safe and healthy place for a child to be. And if you don't leave him, I'm going to call Children's Services and you're going to lose your baby. And I'm like, okay. So I go into like fight or flight mode, which is, you know, generally I go into flight mode. Um, or I did at that time, especially in situations like that. I could be pretty scrappy at times, but um, this was not a situation where I'm going to throw hands at my aunt. You know what I mean? So I pack a bag and I tell baby daddy that I'm going to be staying with my aunt and uncle for a couple of days until um, my daughter's born because they needed to monitor me. I was like going to deliver a couple of days late, which I did. I delivered two days late anyway. Um, and then like a little bit after she was born, like I went back to him because I just felt claustrophobic again. I can't explain to you any better why I made the decision to go back other than the fact that I just, I felt claustrophobic and I felt like that was what I needed to do and so I did. So then like another week or two later, um, you know, I, my parents came down for an event in that town, which was like our hometown. Um, and they said that my daughter and I could go live with them. And I did. We did. Um, like, my aunt and I had had a falling out, and, like, she ended up, like, keeping all of my stuff. So, like, I had nothing. And while I was with my parents, um, you know, they bought me some clothes and stuff. And, like, I had, I got a job whenever Killian was about three months old I started waitressing my baby <laughs> um so I started waitressing and that was like my first like real steady job because before then I had had this job at a call center whenever I was pregnant and that was how baby daddy and I got the house that we were living in that was how we paid for the house that we were living in um and like so everything was just a mess. I mean, I'm sure you can tell that like during this whole period of time, like my life was just a mess and I was just young and naive and I had no idea what I was doing. Um, so I move in with my parents and I'm living with them for a few months and then, um, baby daddy contacts me and he's like, I'm living in this area and you should bring Killian to see me. Um, so like I packed up the car and I went and saw him and just like the first time, like pretty much like overnight, I'm just like moving back in with him. I think for me, like my parents are still married, right? They've been married for 34 years. And so my whole childhood, I grew up wanting a connection like what they have, you know, I wanted to be. I wanted to be married to someone that I loved and have a couple of kids and a couple of dogs and like white picket fence kind of lifestyle and nothing too fancy or anything, you know, but just like I wanted to be happy. And that was my vision of happiness was just like 
to be a mom and to be a wife and, you know, to have a happy little family, um, that happy little nuclear family, <laughs> you know. So I fought for that for a really long time and this relationship was like super abusive. Like everything was just insane. And so like continue, you know, whenever I was living with my parents, I wasn't doing any drugs or anything. I drank, I think like very, very occasionally. Um, but I wasn't doing any kind of drugs at all. I wasn't smoking pot or anything at all. And a huge reason for that was because I was breastfeeding and I was just trying to do everything I could to be like the best mom that I could be. He and I get back together um, within uh, within about nine months, I think, of us getting back together. I was pregnant again. Um, and I'm like working at McDonald's and this whole time baby daddy is not working, right? So like he never provided stable income. He would ask for money from his family or he would like work a side job or whatever, but it, it was just, it was really hard to like try to make ends meet. Whenever I'm the only adult in the house that's working and we've both got this like drug habit, you know, and we drink all the time and stuff. So, and I have to say, like, honestly, at that time, like, it wasn't even really so much, n nearly so much about the drinking as it was about the drugs. Like, mostly it was just a lot of pot, and then occasionally there would be this or that or the other thing. Um, and I would go on, like, a, like a six-month binge where, like, I would go for, like, a six-month period of time. Like, like the almost the only drug I would do would be ecstasy. I would do ecstasy, like, all the time. Or, like, I, I would stop doing ecstasy it wouldn't be available anymore or whatever and then I would do like coke for like six months you know and that would be like the thing like alcohol was the mainstay and like pot was a mainstay for a long time um so it gets to this point where like we're moving around like we're we're moving around like every six months nine months something like that because I can't keep a roof over our heads you know and I'm telling these landlords like oh, I'm gonna get like government assistance like from the state to help pay you for, you know, this back rent or whatever. And I would just like ride it, ride it, ride it until I couldn't anymore. And I was like, I was check hustling um, at check cashing places. I would like write a bunch of checks um, that I, I couldn't come good on to get payday loans so that we would have money to move into the next place. And so like all of that stuff is, is stuff that I've had to clear up since I've gotten sober. Um, so it gets to this point where we're about to get kicked out of a place again. And I think like my son Evan was probably about eight months old, nine months old, something like that. And uh, and I, I had gotten fired from a job. Um, like I said, this relationship was super abusive. It was crazy. And so like he called my job pretending to be someone that was like a customer of mine or whatever and like I think it was something like that and he basically just tried to get me fired and so I get fired from this place and I'm like well how am I gonna make rent money I have like a couple of weeks like I have like like three weeks to make rent money or something like that or like we're gonna get kicked out you know and I'm like so how am I gonna make this money in this short period of time without like, like selling my body. Okay, well I guess I'll fake sell my body. So I was like, I'm gonna get a job at a strip club and I'll just start making tips. And that's how I'm gonna pay rent, right? So I start working in this strip club and um, and I, I get into trouble and I get arrested and you know, like with the drugs that were involved and everything like that, like. So I go to jail and then like they bring up more charges after I get out of jail. So I go to jail again um, and it's just chaos. It's just chaos. And so finally, like we, we get ready and we get evicted from this place. So I'm talking to my dad on Facebook and I'm like, so we're about to get kicked out. Can, can I come and stay with you? And he says, well, you and the kids can come and stay, but he can't come. And I'm like, all right, cool. So. 
this is what we have to do because I'm not going to be on the streets because you won't take care of your business. Um, and I'm tired of like trying to balance everything for everybody. I can't do it. I can only do so much, you know. And so I move in with my parents and I get this job and I'm like striping plants at Lowe's, um, you know, in their, uh, in their outdoor like plant area in the home and garden section. And, um, and I meet this guy, I actually met his sister, um, you know, and baby daddy and I had split up like, cause I was just like done with him and his drama. And, uh, I've always been the type of person that, like, whenever I put my mind to something, like, that's it. Like, that's, I'm going to get it. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Or, like, if I put my foot down on something, I'm done. Like, whenever I make the decision, it's over. And I'll hem and haw on stuff. I'm a Libra. So, like, I'll play with these ideas in my head for, like, forever. And then whenever I make a decision, I don't change my mind. I'm set because I've already played over all the options in my head and I know that this is what I'm doing, right? So I go out one night and I'm drinking and I'm running around and stuff and hanging out with friends and uh, I meet this girl and she tells me that she has a brother and so he came over to my parents' house and my parents were out of town and it was just my sister and I are sitting there and we're hanging out and like because of everything that had been going on with baby daddy I was drinking but I wasn't doing any kind of drugs at all and so I I like rolled a blunt for him and he was like impressed with my blunt rolling skills and uh <laughs> so <laughs> I think that was like you know I don't know he was like attracted to me and I was attracted to him and Six months later, we're married, you know, um, and things with him went much the same way. After a certain period of time, I started doing drugs again. He and I were both drinking really heavily. We're doing a lot of drugs. Um, things just got really, things just got really, really messed up. Whenever I was with baby daddy, I was working in restaurants that whole time. Um, like after I had my daughter. And then I get with door number two um, and I start working in kitchens because I just got tired of dealing with the front of house stuff and trying to like, you know, be dressed up and put my makeup on and deal with people. And, and I was just getting to this point in my life where I was really um, not wanting to deal with people anymore I was tired of trying to put on that like fake face that customer service face so I I start cooking and it's the same culture of course in restaurants like everybody's drinking everybody does drugs because restaurants don't drug test um, very 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 rarely do any restaurants drug test and so I'm cooking and I'm getting really good at it and I'm really enjoying it and uh, and then like a situation happens between door number two and I and like things kind of hit the fan. We have this big physical altercation and so I end up going to my parents' house and I take the kids and we stay there for a couple of weeks and then he starts going like to a 12 step program. I'm like, you need to get help, you know, because you've got the issue. And I still was not at the point where I felt like I had a problem. You know, like I felt like I had everything under control. And I clearly didn't. But that's, you know, the delusion that we tell ourselves. Um, so he goes to meetings for a couple of weeks and I move back in. And I'm like, okay, everything's going to be great now, you know, like he's clean and sober and um, everything's going to be fine. Well, a couple months later, things hit the fan again. I, I'm going to get sober and you need to get sober. And that's just where it's at. Like, if you want to be with me, you'll do this. You know, like I knew, like I felt like, I felt like if I got sober, 
then he would get sober because he would see how well I was doing and he would want to, you know, he would want to like have this leave it to beaver lifestyle with me, you know, and the kids. And so I leave and I move in with my parents and then I get this apartment and I meet this great group of people and we go out and like shoot pool on Wednesday nights after meetings and you know and I'm I'm working steps and I'm and I'm working with the sponsor and everything's really good and then like he comes back in the picture the kids wanted to see him so I had said something to his parents like, hey, I know that you're, you know, like stepdad, but um, the kids want to see you and they miss you and they don't really understand. I mean, they were little. Um, Evan was about a year old whenever we left baby daddy. And so Killeen was about three years old. Um, and so she was about three and a half whenever door number two and I got married and Evan was about a year and a half old. Um, because, you know, like any problem with a substance abuse issue, we do relationships very quickly. <laughs> I've got my own place and everything. Um, but then like he comes over to drop the kids off and we start making goo goo eyes at each other. And before you know it, like a few weeks later, I'm back at the house that he and I were living at together previously that we started renting together after we got married and uh and i'm drinking i had this person who was a friend or i thought was a friend or whatever and she's like oh you're not an alcoholic you're not an addict like i've never seen you get as messed up as i get um and she like cracks a beer in my face and i'm just like salivating i'm salivating and something in my brain clicked and I just was like, screw it, you know? So like I talked to my sponsor and I'm like, okay, so I drank and stuff. And she's like, well, if you aren't sure that you want to work a program, then like, I can't work steps with you. Like, if you're not sure what you want to do, then I, I can't sponsor you, you know? And at the time I was really hurt. Um, I was really, really hurt. And I took that very personally. I didn't understand really I didn't understand. I just felt like I was abandoned. You know, I felt like kind of like everybody, everybody leaves or I have to push them away because things get toxic, right? So two and a half years go by and door number, door number two and I are together for like the first year of that or so, like year and a half of that. And um, in that last like period of time that he and I were together, I had three black eyes. Um, I went to work with a black eye, I'm working in a kitchen. It's like an open kitchen and the public can see me. Like people can see me. And I've got a big black eye. Um, and it was in like a really nice department store. Like, I mean, I'm working in a really nice department store. I got the job whenever I was like in recovery that first time and I kept that job like through whenever I got like clean and sober again. I don't know how I kept the job other than like God's grace. And um, I had some really great coworkers that really, I think that they really, really care about me. Um, and I worked there for like four, little over four years. So like things ultimately hit the fan that last time and I'm done. And, um, and I, I almost, like I almost lost my life is like the bottom line of it. This relationship got to the point where like the last couple weeks that we were together, my kids saw things that they should never see, you know? Um, and there had been like pushing and, and stuff in the house anyways. There had been, you know, but like normally the kids were at my in-laws house or at my parents' house or whatever, whenever stuff would get really, really serious like that, you know, whenever things got like physical. So we split up and of course, like I'm doing drugs um, to deal with my pain because I didn't know how to cope. I didn't have any coping skills at all. I mean, at all. 
Um, my, go my coping skills consisted of drinking and doing drugs. So, of course, like, he and I split up, and a few months later, I jump into this other relationship, you know, because I needed somebody to help pay bills and to comfort me and somebody to hang out with. And, um, and it just, that was just how it happened. Um, and he didn't really drink as heavily as I drank, but he had had a substance abuse issue before. Um, so for the first year that this guy and I were together, I was just like, we were just like high or drunk the whole time. I mean, like all the time. Um, and then I'm laying in bed one night and I was like so high on cocaine that I could not, I, 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 I could not fall asleep. Like my addiction took me to this place where I would get high to the point where like I would have to take like two Benadryl or like two or three Tylenol PMs at like three o'clock in the morning so I could get like three hours of sleep before I had to get up at 6 a.m. 6.30 to run to work in the morning. And so I'm laying there in bed and it's midnight, one, two o'clock in the morning, something like that. And my heart's beating out of my chest and I'm thinking like, if I wake up tomorrow, I'm going to a meeting. I can't do this anymore. I'm going to die. And I can't die. Like, my kids need their mother. I know that I made a lot of bad choices. I know that I really messed up. But I always did the best that I could to be the best mom that I could, to be as present as I could be. Um, I always made sure that there was food. I always made sure that the, um, you know, the utility stayed on and that they, you know, went to the doctor whenever they needed to, that they went to the dentist whenever they needed to, that they, you know, had hugs and kisses and, and we, you know, colored eggs for Easter and we had big Christmases and, you know, like all of those things, like, and I got to this point where, you know, like I had a car and I had the house. We lived in the same house for like over six years by the time it was all said and done. Um, I think we lived, I, I think we lived there for six and a half years minus the like six month period of time or so that we were living like with my parents in, in our own apartment. So I'm laying in bed and I think I'm, and I think I'm going to die and I make this like deal with God. Like if you wake me up, I'm going to a meeting, right? So then in the morning, I wake up and the first thing I do is I pick up the phone and I call the lady who was my first sponsor. I leave her a voicemail and I say, I can't do this anymore. I can't live like this anymore. I'm gonna die. I'm done, I need help. Will you meet me at a meeting? And I went to work and I told my boss, I said, look, so, you know, and I'm still working at the same restaurant. I'm like, look, I need to go to a meeting. And he's like, okay, yeah. And I said, okay, so if I get my prep list done, you know, by this time, can I leave early and go to a meeting? And he's like, yeah, absolutely. Just get your list done. And I was like, okay, cool. So like I get it done like just in time and I'm like walking into this meeting and the last time that I had felt that good was whenever I was sober before. I knew that I wanted to get sober again, but I had told everyone that I was wrong and I didn't have a problem and everything was fine and I've got this, you know, and all of that stuff that that this disease tells me, right? And so I knew for a long time that I wanted to go back um, and start going to meetings again and stuff, but I was just ashamed and uh, afraid of judgment. But whenever I walked into that meeting, nobody judged me. I was welcomed with open arms and all of those people just showed me nothing but love and they were just happy that I was there and I felt like I was home. Like really, really felt 
like I was okay in my own skin and like I didn't have to lie about who I was or anything like that. So I start going to meetings again and I'm working steps with a sponsor and I, um, you know, a sponsor was like awesome, but she and I just didn't jive well. So I asked this lady that, um, she and I had been like sobriety sisters before, um, if she would sponsor me and then like she had some stuff come up and that just didn't really work out for us either. During this time period, um, I had gotten in contact with the lady who was sponsoring me whenever I went back out before. Um, and that's my Jamie. <laughs> and um, so, you know, I, I had like hard feelings still for a while about everything that had happened whenever she told me that she couldn't sponsor me. And whenever I was working with like those two women, whenever I first got sober again, I, I like tried to work through all that stuff and I wrote like inventories and everything and I, I went through all of that and figured out, you know, this is my part and this is why she had to do what she had to do. Um, and so then I saw her at a meeting and she and I talked outside of the meeting and decided to keep in touch. And then whenever things didn't work out with that second sponsor, cause she had a bunch of stuff going on, um, Jamie and this other friend of mine, Amber, were the first two people that I thought of. And I was like, okay, so regardless, like I wanna be in a strong recovery family. And I wanna be surrounded by like really strong women. And so I knew that I wanted one or the other of the two of them to be my sponsor. And so I, um, ultimately I ended up like asking Jamie to sponsor me again. You know, I spent the rest of that time like, like grow and just growing you know, just learning like about who I am and, and really, really, really digging into recovery for the first time. Because the first time that I had gotten sober and was going to meetings and stuff, I was doing steps. But in retrospect, I think I was only doing it just because I wanted to try to make that marriage work. I didn't really, really believe that I had a problem and that like, that things needed to change for me, you know. So at this point in my recovery, things aren't, a, it's not about like not drinking or not using drugs. At this point, it's about how do I do this without putting something in my body, you know. I don't think about drinking or using drugs because it's not my solution anymore. It's not my solution. It's not what I do. It's not who I am. It's not the lifestyle that I live. I don't hang out with people really who drink. I definitely don't hang out with people who do drugs. Um, almost everybody that I know is like clean and sober. Um, and, and, and I don't think that I'm better than anybody because I got sober. I don't think I'm better than anybody. I I just know that this works for me. And I just know that I don't want to like live a life where I'm putting myself in jeopardy and putting my kids in jeopardy and I'm making the wrong choices like that. You know, I think we all mess up from time to time, we all make mistakes. Nobody is perfect. Um, but I guess you could say it's harm reduction to a certain extent. Like I just don't, I don't really associate myself with people who are still actively using for the most part because it doesn't resonate with who I am now. For anyone who is struggling with drugs or alcohol, please get help. Please get help. I don't care what that looks like. I don't care if that looks like rehab or if that looks like 12 step or if that looks like going to therapy because it's not my place to say. But the bottom line is like there is help out there and you are loved and you don't have to live like that anymore. And you don't have to do it alone. reach out, you know, if you need somebody to talk to, 
message me, let me know, comment below. I'll do anything I can for you because I know what it's like to be in that position and I know what it's like to feel alone and to feel helpless and have no idea what you're doing and to feel like nobody gets it, nobody understands. Least of all you, I didn't understand what I was doing. I didn't understand why I couldn't stop. All I knew was that everything just hurt. It just felt empty and it hurt, you know? And I don't want anybody else to have to live like that. So if you stuck it through this whole time, thank you for watching my recovery story. It's a good life. It's a really, really good life. <laughs> and you can have it too.